Hi, it's Dustin Lanier. Thanks for listening. Please find me on LinkedIn for original public sector operations content every week. And please reach out to me if I and my team of procurement professionals at Civic Initiatives can help you be a public procurement change agent. We are recording today on succession planning and public procurement. This is a follow-up in many ways to a presentation we did on hot jobs two weeks ago. And at the end of that, there was a discussion in a direction about how do we plan for the next generation to come into public procurement and how do we give them the learning opportunities to be able to do it. And it just seemed obvious that this would fill its own time slot. We don't often go around and introduce people because most of the voices get known and recognized, but I'll just quickly point out that we have uh, Justin Sullivan from the University of California, Jamie Shore from the state of Maine, uh, Jonathan Walker, who's was recently with the state of Louisiana, Yen Park, who is uh, with San Mateo County, Christina Simraro and Lisa Rolick, who are on my team, who were both public procurement people in uh, Florida and Nebraska, uh, respectively, Jenny Hederman, who's with the state of Massachusetts, and Allie McNally, who is with uh, Arbomarle County. We usually ask Jamie to help us jump off, and then we make sure everybody speaks once. I invite anyone who has a question or a comment to come up and participate, and then we ping pong around without going in that order at the end, and we usually go for about 30, 40 minutes. So, Jamie, thoughts on succession planning and public procurement? So I did a little bit more than succession planning in my thoughts for preparation for leading this off today. Um, you know, if, if for folks that follow Dustin on LinkedIn and looked at the post of what we were talking about today, we not only talk, the prompt was not only succession planning, but it was also like, how do we, how do we get new people into procurement and give them exposure to the work so that they can continue to grow in leadership roles, how do we manage the transaction? So if you think about a full P2P process, that's kind of what I'm equating a little bit of my my comments here today in terms of people, right? So think about the person that you're taking maybe right out of college that's fairly green, and then all the way through, you know, folks that have been in the business for 30 plus years. And I really have the gamut who work for me in the state of Maine. I have one gentleman who is terrific. We hired him and he started the day after graduation with a cybersecurity um, bachelor's degree. He's going on for his master's. And I said, yeah, throw him in the deep end. Right. And that's exactly how I did it. And then I have folks that have never worked a day outside of procurement um, and who have been with me 36 years. She's not on the call, so I, I won't get too specific, but 36 years. So it, it kind of leads me, and I was thinking about how do we go from, you know, the person straight out of college all the way through to the person that's been there for 36 years? How do we do that? There's no way. I, I cannot sit here and pretend to say that I could ever replace um, anybody's knowledge who's been with me for 36 years. That being said, processes have changed. The person has adapted and has done wonderful. So I, I guess my comments are, I'm, I'm going to just touch quickly on John Wooden. And this, was, um, this came from a post recently by NASPA where I was doing an, an interview. And John Wooden, of course, the, an English teacher who happened to also be just saying the most amazing basketball coach of all time. If you have not read um, his book, I would encourage everybody to do so. He is amazing. He spent 15 years preparing for the Bruins at UCLA just to win their first championship. And then the 16th year they won. And then they he continued to repeat that championship formula for another 10 years. So I say that because leadership and getting folks to develop in their career is a trial and error type of process. Right? The best leaders are lifelong learners. They take measures to create organizations that foster and inspire learning throughout, directly from Coach Wooden. The most effective leaders are those who realize it's what you learn after you know it all that counts most. So for 36 years, I have people that um, are still learning, and that is incredible. Right, So as a leader in procurement, 
um, I, I do follow Coach Wooden on a lot of his philosophy. Um, he never believed in the word win. His philosophy was that if you maximized potential, success was achieved. So in terms of succession planning, you bring new folks on and they listen, they read, they observe, and then they learn by trial and error. And that is, in my opinion, the best way that you can promote succession planning by somebody, um, you know, giving them enough time to work with some of the younger folks and so that those younger folks can listen and observe and read and do all the things. Good stuff, Jamie. So I'm going to come to Allie next because she actually put some thoughts together. And so I know that she was prepared to jump into this topic. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah, I was uh, going to share that being newer in the public sector, I have um, needed to do a lot of research to come up to speed on specifically this industry. And I found some really great resources from research that was done and um, published by a number of resources. Of Obviously, you know, there's common ones like NIGP. And uh, I think that there were a couple in partnership with Aspire. Um, Anyhow, what I really wanted to share with this audience is um, it's not to be underestimated how valuable and insightful other publications are to being able to make decisions to operationalize and organize your team. There's some great benchmarking studies on compensation and retention that were published in 2018 that I found to be very relevant. And additionally, there's um, some info, even though it was, you know, it's now six years old, there's still um, some insights from a research report on the value of procurement certification. So taking just a moment to, I guess, connect the dots to succession planning here is that retention, I think, is um, really something that needs to be looked at first in terms of your teams and how and why people are moving. Are they moving within your team and or your organization for growth or are they leaving for other reasons? Um, And... Um, have that in mind as you you continue to develop um, and improve an actual lattice plan for not just promoting up in public procurement, but also considering, you know, growth opportunities, particularly for more junior individuals, as Jamie was saying, of learning other functions within the public sector, because there's great value, I think, to knowing upstream and downstream implications um, and, and folks being able to grow themselves as professionals and then maybe even come back to public procurement um, and have that better perspective. Great. Well, so, and thanks, Allie. And let's take those to Jonathan, who, like I said, recently had to go through some of that process. So Jonathan, how have you guys had to think about the succession planning and how to really build some of those opportunities for people to to take leadership roles? Yeah, thank you. That's something that Paula and I have taken seriously and our leadership team has taken seriously ever since we've gotten here. Um, Whenever the state centralized procurement about six years ago at the same time combining purchasing and contractual review into one office Uh, we experienced a lot of turnover at the same time we were adopting sap as our erp system so there was a lot of upheaval you know at the time um, it wasn't as understandable in retrospect i can see that it was understandable that we had a lot of people leave including a lot of senior talent and so we found ourselves in a hole of you know, <laughs> rebuilding and, you know, making sure that we would never get caught in the same position again. So we've been intentional about it. Um, one of the pieces of, of wisdom that I received actually from my dad, he worked for the state of Louisiana for 37 years and he had a, 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 a one pager of management proverbs or maxims that he shared with me. And one of them was to, to hire like a chess player, think two moves ahead. And I, I always thought that was really profound, but what I've learned in practices that's really really hard Um, one because you don't know the person who's interviewing and two um, you have to hire for the moment you know you're hiring for the position that you have in front of you Um, so in my practice it hasn't been a matter of hiring two steps ahead it's once you have your team assembled then you can start making that uh, succession planning and with 
that chess mindset. Um, we, we try to expose people to opportunities. One of the things that I've learned, and I worked in public procurement for seven years, and I would say for at least five of those seven years, I was really, really bad at delegating. Um, I, I had a much better, you know, I was more comfortable doing it myself because I knew it would get done right. Um, but one thing I learned to do was just start building teams where previously it would have just been something I carried. So just for example, like if we were building a submission uh, to compete for the Cronin Award with NASPO, you know, where typically I might have just written that myself, got Paula to review it and then submit it, you know, build a team and give people the opportunity to contribute, to propose edits, to think carefully about how to articulate the value of a project to an external party. Um, it's amazing how people will step up sometimes if, as, you, as Jamie said, you throw them in the water. Uh, it, it's, it's not the, the kindest approach, but if, or it may not seem the, 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 the nicest approach, I should say, but if you, if you give people those opportunities, it's amazing how many people will swim and not just swim, but thrive. I've been the beneficiary of that approach. Um, I attribute what success I've had, um, been, and I've been very blessed. I've been fortunate to have the career trajectory I've had. Uh, is people who gave me the opportunity, and I stepped up, and I've continued that same trend of giving people opportunities that were bigger than their job title. And if they stepped up, they went on the short list of you know people that were on my radar for management promotional opportunities. But the people that step up and, and shine in those optional projects are, are really the best secret I can offer for identifying succession planning talent on the front end. Justin, succession planning for higher ed must be interesting, especially at a system level, because you have the system office and then you have all the individual campuses and you may have People come from campuses to system and then from system back to campuses. And there's, of course, just the natural flow of people trying to build careers. So how do you guys deal with succession planning? And do you think there's any difference in a higher ed procurement environment than in the uh, some of the other state environments? I don't know how different it is. Uh, first thing I want to do is say thank you to Jamie for shouting out Coach Wooden uh, and our UCLA Bruins. Uh, UCLA is about 25% of the spend uh, that my team looks after. And in addition to being um, a sports powerhouse with 119 national championships, uh, they're a huge uh, winner of, of grant funding uh, and a source of innovation, uh, you know, for California and, and the world. Um, you know, I think in higher education, uh, and really in, in any organization, I think the things that are different for us so maybe are a little bit um, driven by the size of our university and kind of the federation of, uh, of what we do. And that is in sort of a, a state setting, um, the, what each agency does within a state uh, maybe is more independent and less linked. Um, all of our campuses are in the same uh, kind of core, uh, share the same core mission uh, and, and educate students and, and have similar spend categories and have um, some similar processes. But, um, you know, I, I think um, many of our challenges are, are the same. I think this that succession planning is something that both public and private organizations uh, wish they could be better at or aspire to be better at. I think the thing that we try to think about is, you know, maintain um, maintain a dynamic environment on our team. Uh, if you think about swimming in a, a stagnant lake or pond, that's not a healthy place to, to be. You know, that, that you might get sick, but uh, if you're swimming in a lake that has a waterfall and that waterfall is moving and, 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 uh, and changing, um, you know, you're going to have a good experience. And it's the same way in your organization. Your organization has to continue uh, to evolve and grow. And so to me, succession planning is where your development planning uh, that you have with your team kind of meets your organizational planning that um, where you understand what's going to happen in your organization and, and what are the types of roles that you're going to have to fill. You know, understanding what, what the aspirations are uh, for your team members, whether they're early career, mid-career, or heading towards 
uh, a more a more more seniority in their career, understanding what types of experiences they want to have, what types of skills that they want to develop, what types of relationships uh, that they need to be successful, understanding those things, and then and then being advocates for them, helping them get exposure uh, within the organization, helping them to find mentors, uh, helping them to access training and, and, and get the skills, um, really positions you uh, to have. Um, have options when you think about succession planning. Um, a couple of things that I think um, are helpful within the public sector for, for just about anybody uh, is to really know and understand uh, the HR policies and procedures for uh, where you're at and have a relationship with the HR team uh, because, you know, our hiring environment is a, is a little bit different. Um, I think we get relatively fewer um, at-bats in terms of hiring than you know, our, our, most of our private sector counterparts. And so you have to make each one count, uh, but you can do succession planning um, if, you, if you really understand um, your, your HR our policies. Uh, and then the last thing you know, I try to do personally in my role uh, and make sure that you know, my peers and actually the leaders that report to me is to make sure that they're thinking about their potential successors uh, and, um, and uh, making sure that they are understanding the context of the role and, and uh, you know, getting the chance to, uh, to participate fully uh, in, in your organization. And so those are really the things that I would look to um, as, I, as our team thinks about um, succession planning. So Jenny, why don't you give some of your thoughts on how you guys try to grow people to be able to fill some of these leadership roles in the future and cultivate that excellence from your pool as you're planning on leadership expansion or transfer. Great. Thank you, Dustin. Jenny Hederman um, at the Comptroller's Office in Massachusetts. Um, and I think what I'm seeing as far as the hiring process having changed during COVID is that what we needed to do during that process as government was be much more agile in dealing with you know, a catastrophic situation. And those people that really rose to the top, and a lot of the folks have already talked about it, were really people that we relied on for information, how, how we're dealing with IT, how we get information out, how we deal with the, these critical issues. And um, it's challenging in government because a lot of folks are in union positions. So they're often interpreted to be boxes that you're kind of stuck within. But what I'm seeing in government now, which is very refreshing, is that there's a leadership opportunity for growth, as Ali was talking about, at all levels. And everybody now has an opportunity to express that kind of leadership role. And I think what government is trying to do is cultivate talent within all of these roles. And I think people coming into government, if they're thinking kind of outside the box that they're not just going to be doing the listed things on a job posting, but their value is going to come with what Jonathan was talking about, which is really strategic thinking and really being able to understand the organization as a whole. So areas like being um, agile and understanding how IT operates in your organization and throughout your state, um, understanding about risk and compliance and that those still are requirements even when you're in a pandemic. And then cross-training. That's one of the biggest things that I think um, has been successful, at least in our organization and other departments that we've talked about, is they're planning for people not to be there, either because um, they're not available from the pandemic or they're uh, retiring. We have a, a large population that's retiring. And um, people who are just moving on to other roles, which is the kind of the retention issue. So the more that this um, succession planning is really talking about how you build the organization. So if somebody leaves, you're not going to implode and, and really strategically thinking about that and then cultivating your talent internally and challenging them, as Jonathan said, to really do a little bit more than what you um, are planning them to do. Give them an opportunity, you know, that untapped potential of commenting on things because what we found is that many people who really are not part of our leadership discussion, especially in our IT groups, had an enormous amount of valuable information 
that we were able to use because we listened to what they had to say. We asked them, what are your thoughts on this? How could we improve? What would you do in this situation? So simply asking questions to all of your staff at all levels of your organization is really going to help with identifying kind of your weak spots and what you could do better. And I also think it's not replacement planning anymore. It's not just filling a role. It's really thinking about, um, you know, if this person stays for two, three, five years, how are they going to grow in the organization? What leadership opportunities are we going to give them? How are they going to fit with other people in our organization? So I think it's a much more, um, as Jonathan said, kind of building the team and really thinking across the organization. So I think the, the, the role of government is really growing. The responsibility of government is always increasing. And I think the way that this is playing out is that roles are uh, less in silos. Those silos are going away, the hierarchy is going away, and it's much more of a team approach. And how do you really fulfill those critical tasks as government, which is the, it's just a, a much more holistic um, attitude. So I think that's what I've been seeing over the past two or three years. And I think that's where uh, we've been successful internally because we've been doing that. And other agencies around state government have been doing that also. So that would be just one piece of advice I would, I would throw out there for folks. Jenny out. Thanks, Jenny. Lots of good stuff in there. Um, so, Yen, you joined us uh, for the first time last time around, and I'm pleased to see you back. And so you're with uh, San Mateo County, and um, I'm interested in how the county is trying to think about succession planning and what experience you've had on trying to help implement those concepts. Thank you very much, Dustin. And yes, you got everything correct. Um, so I'm the county manager, uh, so the, the contract manager for the county. And uh, I returned to the county about a year ago, but I started with uh, San Mateo many years ago. And it was good and bad to see that things hadn't changed. <laughs> um, and now we have an aging workforce uh, in the last 12 months that I've been there um, in the centralized team, which is pretty small, uh, we've replaced three quarters of our people in the last 12 months. So we have a whole bunch of new people onboarded from the private industry. And I'm pretty sure we have uh, 26 departments uh, within the county. I'm pretty sure that this is a trend that's going through all the departments. Um, so what I've been working on is to try and get the different departmental um, contracting uh, and procurement people to really document the information that they have within their system. I think too much of it right now in our organization is running on just like I learned how to do this and I learned it from somebody and that's just how we do it. Um, and over time, the documentation, the procedural handbooks and so forth have not been there or have not been updated uh, or have never been created in the first place. So as people walk out the door for promotions and uh, for retirement and so forth, we're losing a lot of knowledge on that. So I've been focusing a lot on the training and documentation side. And then for the succession planning, I don't think that uh, there has been a focus on a procurement career within our organization. Um, and so once we sort of do some of the procedural cleanup and I'm revising the, uh, the, the, the contract manual and the, the purchasing manual, once we do all of that, we're actually going to have a conversation also with HR about trying to develop steps for our people to sort of improve the retention of the people that we have um, because I think also because of the downturn in the economy, we're seeing a lot of people come in who are younger uh, than your traditional sort of government worker that is more uh, uh, middle-aged and also more senior in uh, their knowledge. And uh, I know, you know, from previous meetings with HR, younger people tend to uh, enter the county less. Uh, they prefer private industry. 
And then they, even if they do enter government, they stay for a very short period of time. Um, so our team is pretty young um, and nimble and innovative, which is wonderful. And we're trying to sort of keep them and uh, across the organization as well. I'm seeing that trend. We need to give them a pathway to move. Um, and that means, you know, having those promotional steps and uh, projects for them to work on to expand their their knowledge within procurement and that they have a drive to want to do that as well, which might not have existed in the past. Uh, so some of, these are some of the things that we're currently working on to, to drive some innovation within our organization and as well as to plan ahead because we're watching people retire en masse. Um, and I'm Yen and that's it for me. Great stuff. Uh, so... Kristen, you joined, and Kristen, we're talking succession planning. Uh, you're with Shelby County, and how do we create opportunities to grow talent from within? How do we think about uh, shadowing and creating opportunities so that as people retire or change work, that we've built a robust team internal? And I know that in your personal endeavors that you talk a lot about leadership as well. So um, if you're able to come off mute and talk from where you're at, then why don't you add something to our conversation? Oh, there I am. Look, it's been a few <laughs> weeks. I hadn't been on Clubhouse. I had to figure out how to get off mute. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kristen Webb with the purchasing office uh, here in Shelby County, as Justin mentioned. And um, I, I haven't had a chance to sit in long, so I hope I'm not sounding too repetitive. But um, for me, I think the most important piece about succession planning is being intentional and taking the time to actually plan it through. Um, and Internally here at my office, what we have done is um, kind of when I came on board is making sure I sat down and understood um, the professional development that I needed to uh, look at for each individual. Um, and with that, also considering the needs of the office, um, should there be any transition, should there be any um, one that moves up or out? And um, in, in understanding what people's own professional development um, goals were, as well as operationally what our needs I have been able to create a succession plan, one that I've actually written, which I think is also important to make sure that it's a plan that's written and documented uh, very well. Um, and just taking those two components and kind of plugging in what the new uh, structure looks like if there are ever any changes. Um, for us, I've found that um, I have team members that would be okay in moving um, to a position that would be considered um, lower. Um, and, you know, while when we think of succession, a lot of times we think of upward movement, but it could be uh, a lateral move that may make sense for someone or for the operations, as well as maybe moving someone to a position um, of, of a lower grade, I'll say. Um, and so just, you know, documenting that, uh, understanding their goals, understanding what the overall operational goals are. Um, makes it helpful. Uh, I did catch yours a bit, Yen, when you mentioned documentation being really key, um, making sure that my team is cross-trained. So specifically um, in those roles where there are very few people that do the same thing, I've made a point to make sure that they're all cross-trained. And then, of course, that documentation exists. Um, so if they've ever got to fill in, they can definitely just move right into it. And it's proven to be helpful um, in maybe some long-term absenteeism that we've had with uh, particular individuals. Um, and I think they're also equipped that if that individual just phased completely out, we'd be able to bring them on board into that space if um, obviously our HR policies allowed us to do so. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much that that's kind of where we are. I just uh, early on came on board, wanted to make sure I understood um, if there were any changes planned or unplanned, how could we continue to operate uh, in satisfying professional development as well as the operations of the office. Um, we haven't gone as far as this, uh, creating a succession plan outside of the department, uh, which I think that gets to be a bit trickier. But I do believe in those cross-training opportunities, those exposure and those shadowing moments, they are obtaining the skills that are potentially potentially transferable outside. So indirectly uh, cr creating a succession for them outside of the office, outside of this office as well. So I hope I, I touched a little bit and didn't do too much um, reiterating of what's already been stated. No, I think it was great. So I'll pick up a little write-up I did on Tuesday and just some of the major points and um, you know, I put out four things and so I'll talk about them. And then after that, if anybody's 
had any, since we've gone all the way around, if anybody has anything they'd like to add, then please just come off mic and talk without being called on. Uh, so I wrote about four things, you know, shadowing, really trying to create some opportunity for people to learn things or see things they haven't done. I've tried to do that some in my own, in my own shop where we move very quickly across a lot of clients. So we recently brought on a new hire from, from Detroit and we have been trying to involve her in a lot of different projects so that she can get flavors of things, even if she's not able to contribute yet. You know, Jen Myers, who had done an interview with me several, uh, well, quarters ago now, um, you know, she talked about how the city of Tucson really tries to put a lot of emphasis on shadowing as a training capacity. That opportunity to be able to to be involved, the recognition, trying to give people opportunities to be seen and understood and find ways to um, give little growth paths within the organization or at least simple personal recognition to try to get people to really want to be in and stay in the profession, which is a critical Uh, focus of mine. And then certification, I think is interesting because we get people on a learning path. So it's so it's easy sometimes to just focus on the job as it is in front of us. But I think some of the certifications through great organizations like NIGP and UPPCC and a lot of the certifications several of us on the stage have, it really makes you both build a a learning mindset that the job is more than simply the, the, the transaction that's in front of us today and that it helps to build a connection to a larger community of professionals so that it really reinforces procurement as a profession and a destination, uh, which I think is very important when we're talking about not just succession planning as a general concept, but specifically regarding succession in public procurement. So with that, if uh, any of you guys have anything that someone has said to you said in this course of things that kind of grabbed you and made you want to chime in again or something that you think is been missing from our conversation, please, uh, without being called on, just come off mic and talk about it. Thanks, Justin. This is Allie. I wanted to echo um, some of what Jenny said about cross-training and share a recent experience that we've had on my team. It's not to be underestimated, just asking your team about their interest. Um, We had an example where we recently upgraded our procurement system and needed to take on the responsibility for having internal administration done on the structure of the system. Um, And by just doing an all call to our whole team, um, I learned that the warehouse manager was interested, even though he didn't have extensive technological skills or has run any procurements or solicitations in the past, he expressed great interest um, in, in learning and in working in the system and helping out where he could. And he not only has taken that on in the last year, but he's also actually helped us do cursory reviews of purchase requisitions uh, in preparation for the buyers to pick them up and then review them. And he actually has carried the highest volume of those reviews across my entire team. So where it wouldn't have been obvious from his job description as warehouse manager, which he does exceptionally well, um, you know, he was able to cross train and, you know, help our team with some higher volume seasonality as well. So as we think about succession planning, um, it doesn't have to be the supervisor or manager's idea, putting it out there to the folks on your team to tell you what they are interested in learning in um, can be really beneficial for, for everyone. And this is Jenny. And what Ali said is so important, I think, inviting people to have an opinion or how would you do it better or what do you think? needs to be done at every level of the organization, I think is how you find people who are interested in, in providing this information. And, and what I've also found is a lot of people are really shy at first. It will take them a while to feel comfortable enough to offer their opinion. So I think providing these opportunities, not just once a year, but often uh, really is important. And also maybe not always face-to-face, but sending an email um, with ideas is also a good opportunity. But any opportunity for growth, I think, Uh, makes the organization better. Jenny out. To piggyback on something that Jenny said, and this is Jonathan, um, one thing that I think Paula has done really well here in the state of Louisiana is she recognizes that just because somebody is a great worker doesn't mean that they are going to 
have a, a great interviewing presence. Some people just don't interview well, a combination of nerves and whatever else it is. And so one of Paula's famous quotes in the office that's percolated throughout the office is uh, she has this quote that says, you interview every day you come to work and every, and every day you don't come to work. Um, and so the message that, that gets across to, to the, to the office is that by the time we have an opening and we're looking to fill a management position, it isn't a high stakes, one time, one off decision of who can have the best interview for it. It's that we've been thinking about this in advance. We've been looking at it in advance, um, taking stock, you know, compiling an inventory of skills and uh, aptitudes that people show when they're not being interviewed um, so that we have that in their back pocket. And we've had people come to us and say that that's a huge relief because they didn't think that they would be able to interview for it well or that they didn't know that they were in the running for a position uh, until they were asked to interview. But it's because we had been, you know, taking stock of that long before we ever had a position come vacant. A, a big fan to hear that Yen's working with HR uh, her human resources to define kind of what it means to have a career uh, in procurement at, at San Mateo County. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish by focusing on people, but, you know, while it can be tedious and sometimes difficult working with HR and, and, and figuring out that career path can really put in place a structure that makes it a lot easier to support your people over the long term. And if you're looking for uh, a place where you can have a real long-term impact, it's in defining the roles and the career paths that you have in procurement and contracting. So I really, really think that's great. And, and this topic coming on the heels of, um, you know, our, our, our conversation about hiring and recruiting uh, last time really just sort of uh, gives you a full flavor of the cycle, right? Hire curious people. Uh, help them grow in ways that they want to grow and then be aware of and look for opportunities, be aware of what your organization needs and look, look for the opportunities to put your people in, in that position to grow. I think that's uh, I think we're near a mic drop on that one. Although Yen came off. So Yen, uh, why don't you chime in and have the last word and then we'll tell people how to get a, a listen to this and some of the links that Ali mentioned uh, a little while ago. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you, Justin, for the shout out. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I worked in a couple of different organizations and none of them certified um, the procurement staff. And that's one of the things that I'm working on now. Um, and to me, it sort of like gives us a base foundation uh, for our procurement staff and their knowledge base. And it uh, gives them sort of like a bigger world of what procurement is, not just procurement within our organization. And hopefully they'll stay with us. But even if they don't, then they're in a better footing for their procurement career. And uh, with the announcement of like training, um, we've uh, provided basic training now and uh, for certification availability, I've really seen the leader in procurement mm. within my organization step up um, and the staff who are just so eager to get that knowledge I can see that they will have a long career with us and they would be the people that I would want to keep um, and that's it thank you well and and we're working with a client right now who has a very aggressive and forward-thinking mentality around looking at the training programs that they provide and then saying, how do those align with some of the national certification opportunities? Because this particular client is very interested in both the growth of individuals and the growth of the profession and being able to think about how we benefit the individual in their growth only benefits the organization in the organization's growth. So it, I think there is, a lot to be said for how the national certifications and then the ability to apply it down to uh, the individual specificities. It's a gracious thing to do. It says to people that this is a profession and we're going to grow you to be able to do your job here, but we're going to help you build towards a career path. And if there's any one cliche that you hear a lot in conversations about uh, public procurement, there's a phrase that many people fell into public procurement and I'll Acknowledge that I, to some degree, fell into public procurement after spending time more on the, the technology and CIO side when I was at the state of Texas. So 
Um, but I have really enjoyed public procurement and I found a passion in it. And I think it's a great thing to be able to build and to show people who are considering career paths that, that procurement is something that can carry them for a long period of time, give them a lot of opportunity for creativity if we structure it that way. And so it leads back to our discussion about both hot jobs a couple of weeks ago and then succession planning today. How do we encourage people to join the profession and then build that next level of leadership community? So this was a great discussion today. Allie mentioned at the first some uh, some research that she's done. So I'm going to, when I post this podcast, probably later today, uh, uh, under the Public Procurement Change Agent uh, podcast, which I'd ask you guys all to subscribe to if you're not, so that then I don't have to keep saying it. <laughs> um, but I will post this on LinkedIn. And then, Allie, if you can post some of the links that you mentioned there, I'll make sure to show you how to do that. We do this every couple of weeks or every two or three weeks, depending on uh, what topics are and whether there's something that's hot and current and what everyone's schedule is. Everyone who's on this call is a, is a busy practitioner, uh, including several of the people in the audience. So I appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge and uh, being here and supporting what we're doing. So with that, I want to thank Jamie and then Justin, Jonathan, Yen, Jenny, Ali, Kristen, and then uh, Christina and Lisa on my team. So with that, I'll let you get back to your busy afternoons and uh, thank you for being here. Hi, it's Dustin Lanier. Thanks for listening. Please find me on LinkedIn for original public sector operations content every week. And please reach out to me if I and my team of procurement professionals at Civic Initiatives can help you be a public procurement change agent. 